The Trap Set will always be available for free, but we rely on donations from our listeners. Please visit our website at thetrapset.net and click donate. Subscribe to our show on iTunes. And if you enjoy what you hear, give us a review. This is Joe Wong. Welcome to The Trap Set, where each week we explore the lives of drummers. I want to play something for you. You're hearing Then Comes Dudley by The Jesus Lizard, featuring my guest, Mac McNeely, on drums. Formed in 1987, the Chicago-based band developed a feverishly loyal following thanks to a series of propulsive studio records and live shows that redefined the terms wild and frenetic. Mac's monumental drumming locked in with the bass playing of David William Sims to create an unshakable framework for the piercing serpentine guitar of Dwayne Dennison and unhinged surrealist vocals of David Yao. McNeely left the Jesus Lizard in 1996, and the band broke up a couple years later. In the subsequent years, they've come to be recognized as one of the most influential rock bands of their generation. I spoke to Mac near his home in Evanston, Illinois. And now our conversation with Mac McNeely. You know, I guess uh, I'd call myself kind of a well-rounded kid, I guess. Uh, Music was always there. Um, But... uh, I had other interests such as throwing stuff at cars, uh, lighting off firecrackers, uh, lighting mailboxes on fire. Did you, you know, ever the, blow up a toilet? I didn't ever blow up a toilet. I don't think so. Uh, I, at least it doesn't like ring a bell. I, I may have thrown something down a commode somewhere, but that was probably – I was an accessory. I wasn't like the instigator probably. I don't know. I, I would mostly try to get – reactions out of people while remaining anonymous like that's like the lighting the mailbox on fire i'd see a car coming down the street uh and then i'd you know stuff a bunch of paper towels in the mailbox light it on fire then hide and watch when they would come around the corner and see this flaming mailbox and they didn't really know what to do and they'd eventually just drive off but you know there wouldn't be anyone around and I seem to get a kick out of that. I don't know why. Sort of inserting myself into people's reality. Did you study drumming? No. No, I didn't. I, at first, I took, uh, I took guitar lessons for about, <laughs> for about uh, maybe two or three weeks. I wanted to, first, I wanted to be an electric guitar player because I thought that was pretty cool. And uh, once I found out you had to play lessons or, you know, take uh, lessons and then you had to, like, study Cording and fingering all that, it, uh, the glitz and glamour of it just kind of went and died, you know. So, so drums just made more sense to you intuitively. Yeah, and I heard you talking about this on another podcast where you said it's always someone's uncle or cousin. Well, it was my cousin in this uh, in this case. Uh, my cousin had a band. He was a few years older than I was. What was his name? Shields. That's even Shields, a cool name. Shields Goodman. Yeah, and uh. <laughs> He uh, had a band in his basement, and I, I was fortunate enough to be over there one day. And they had, like, he played drums, and then they had a guitar player and a guy on a, a Farfisa, I think, a compact organ. And uh, they, no bass player, and they played uh, Doors in Agata de Vida and stuff like that. And I was just like, man, this is 
really cool. You know, it's just like amazing. And uh, so I begged my mom to, you know, help me get a drum set. My parents were divorced, so my mom raised me. And uh, uh, it just came like really easy to me. Uh, you know, there was a lot of like struggling with like, how you know, teaching yourself, okay, this does this, this does this. And then looking at pictures of drummers to see where they're putting the snare drum. Okay, it's flat between their legs. It's not like angled off at a side. And so kind of made some adjustments. And then pretty soon it was real easy to at least play along to bands like with headphones. And I'd, I'd learn that way. I'd just copy like whatever Ringo was playing or Charlie Watts or something. And then later trying to like copy what John Bonham was playing and, you know, right. any kind of approximation and, and all that stuff was going in. It's just like... How old were you at the time? Um, probably started drums when I was about 12 or 13. Like right around the same time puberty was happening and you oh, were yeah. branching off as a person. Yeah, yeah. I, I was exploding in, in all directions, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was, you know, like. Blowing up mailboxes, playing I, drums. I, I, you, you just can't jerking have Jerking off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, everything, you know. It's like, you know, you can't leave one thing out, you know. Were you good at other things? Were you a good you student? Mean? Oh, no. <laughs> so, no, I was not a good student. Um, Were you into sports or, or anything I was else? a good student. I, I was, my behavior was good in the classroom, but, but I wasn't a good um, – my grades weren't very good. They were like uh, squeaking by at best, you know. Um, once I got out of elementary school, you know, th- other things became more interesting like, you know, music and girls. And Were you a pretty happy kid? Yeah, I was a happy kid. I I wouldn't, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't say I was a depressed kid by any stretch. I, I had, you know, I had a good childhood and uh, um, I'm still having it right now. <laughs> so, you know, we don't leave everything behind. Right. So you said your mom raised you. Did you have much of a relationship with your dad? Yeah, my dad was real, um, he, he made it a point to uh, stay in touch and visit. Uh, did he leave town? Yeah, he did. He moved to Nashville. And um, we, I was pretty young when my parents got divorced, so he made it a point to come visit on a regular basis, which was really great. And I think it was part of why we have a good relationship now. How did you wind up in Chicago? I met David Yao, uh, singer of the Jesus Lizard, uh, in, and David Sims in uh, Texas and Austin when the band 86 went through there. They came to, or they were at some club that we were playing, uh, and David Yao and I talked afterwards, and um, I knew he had been in Scratch Acid, and uh, I think they were just breaking up or had just broken up, and uh, he, you know, he and I traded phone numbers. We both said, hey, you know, maybe someday we can do something, you know, that would be cool, and then I I didn't hear from him for a couple of years, and then he... uh, out of the blue, gave me a call and seemed out of the blue. And then he said, you were putting this band together. It's called the Jesus Lizard. Uh, We've got a EP with a drum machine, but we want to get a drummer. Uh, We have plans to go to Europe and uh, travel around a lot. And I'm like, ding, that's perfect. You know, it's like, (laughs) so, and at the time I was playing, I was trying to play bass in this band, uh, other band in Atlanta um, called Phantom 309. And, uh, I'm not a bass player, so it was good. It was like a good chance to get back playing drums. He sent me a cassette of the stuff they were doing, and I listened to it, and I thought, man, this is so cool. It's like, it's perfect, you know? You say that the songs came together really quickly. Did it feel like you had a really special connection and great chemistry immediately? Yeah, it did. Yeah, and it, which is really in- interesting. Um, I don't know exactly why, but I don't spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. You know, it's just like something that that uh, we we felt like, um, at least to me, it, it felt like brothers almost like you know someone that you've known for like way longer than you really have and um it just uh 
it felt good because it, it, that was a band where you could just like trust that the other guys were going to come up with parts that were right. And there wasn't a lot of, why don't you play this? Or why don't you change what you're doing here? It's like, there was a lot of just like, you know what? You're the drummer. You do your drum thing, you know, and uh, let the bass player do his bass thing. But the whole thing came together really well. And the fact that we had all been in other bands was good because we didn't end up doing any, um, it wasn't any grandstanding player wise. It was all like, let's support the whole. And it, but that concept was, was already in us all at the time. It wasn't like we had to learn how to play for what the song needed and not overplay. We had already been through a lot of that stuff, like being in earlier bands where look what I can do and all this kind of stuff. Right. And so it also uh, <laughs> seems like the aesthetic was a lot tighter for this band. Like you guys were on oh, the you, same page versus other bands where one guy wants to sound like the cars and another guy wants to sound like Dixie Dregs or yeah, whatever. Yeah, we didn't want to sound like anyone. And we didn't also want to, you know, I think we just, it was so, we were so fortunate to come along at that time, the four of us coming together because we ended up creating music that we all, felt like came out of us naturally and uh, we had influences of course but we weren't definitely like you said we're not trying to make make it sound like this or a little bit of this and you know pinch of that and wasn't anything like that you know so how did the band function was there a leader or was it a democracy uh it was very much a democracy i think uh although there were certain aspects that one member would handle like uh you know, David Yao is the one responsible for all the lyrics, you know, and uh, David Sims, uh, bless his heart, he uh, was the accountant for the band, you know. And now he's an accountant, a CPA. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that comes in very handy when you have a guy in the band that can do that and do it well. And he, you know, I have to thank him again and retroactively for doing that because that was, uh, it was nice. We, we had a handle on our money, you know. What kind of stuff would you get into as a band? I mean, the music is pretty wild and the lyrics are pretty wild. How did the band function? Well, well, the, the craziness came mostly from David, David Yao. I mean, he, you know, it's funny because the band was, uh, you know, we didn't take ourselves really seriously as, uh, as people. You know, we, we, we didn't mind poking fun of each other or ourselves or, you know, being the butt of a joke or whatever. But we took our music real seriously in how we... Uh, wrote it and wanted it to be presented. So the musicians, the the guitar, bass, and drums were always uh, very precise. And the way we played that music, um, we wanted it to be as lean and mean as you can get for for what we were writing, um, but still have you know some humanness to it. So it's like let's cut out the fat wherever we can. Um, which I think worked great on the first few records. Um, and then David Yao was the foil to that. So it was like, he's going to be all over, and you can never tell what he's going to do, but behind him, or in contrast to that, here are these three guys that are going to be playing this music that's going to sound like a screwdriver going inside another screwdriver. You know, it's going to be like, ah! Yeah. You know, ah uh -huh, You know? I think we wanted to, uh, you know, most bands want to do this. We wanted to blow some people away, you know, and like we felt like we had something naturally, like we were speaking about earlier, that could do that. And so we spent a lot of our energy trying to be like, I don't know. Did I, you I don't practice think we, a lot as a band? Yeah, we did. We rehearsed a lot because we wanted it to be uh, pretty wound tight, you know. Um, and there wasn't a lot of... Uh, like a variation, like as as far as from gig to gig to gig, uh, David Yao was never the same twice, and we were pretty much there every time. And it got to be where we would take him completely out of our monitors because it would throw <laughs> us off, you know? It'd be like, well, I don't know if he's going to come in here or not, but I don't want to even hear him, you know? I'll be able to hear him in, in the house sound system without, you know, 
him, you know, coming through. Um, but, uh, but it's funny. So <laughs> we relied on each other and it was very much, it was almost pl like playing an instrumental band when we play on yeah. stage. Cause we, we tune him out, you know, like, and let him do his thing, which is fine. For the first few albums, uh, you were on one of the great independent labels of all time, Touch and Go. Uh, and then you decided to sign with Capital around 96. Mm -hmm. uh, what went into that decision? Ah, boy, that's kind of a loaded one. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we... Uh, were... I should also point out, you know, at the time, the, lots of people in the indie community would look down upon bands that signed to major labels. Whereas now I think nobody would really... Begrudge uh, anyone. Yeah, anything. that's the whole thing. It, there was a big backlash about it. Um, we were just trying to do uh, the go to the next level, which didn't mean selling out or changing our music or wearing platform shoes all of a sudden or putting on lipstick. It was like same thing, you know. Just let's see if we can maybe get some money and uh, do some adult things, like you know, put some money on a house, you know, maybe uh, you know, actually be responsible with some money, you know, actually make some money, um, see some rewards from it, see if we can reach a broader audience, you know, what do you do next? <clears throat> and then <clears throat> at the time, there was, like I said, such a backlash because people really, they they want you to be... Uh, they want you to be the underdog forever, right? They do. They want you to be their precious little secret that no one cool – that's – you know, all these uncool people will never know about you because, like, you're cool and I know about you and you're always going to remain this thing for me. And, like, that's really unfair to any artist because most artists that sell out, I doubt that at the time they were trying to sell out or, you know, sell their soul for, you know, who knows. It's like – you're and just you're just caught at a time. Issue nowadays it is less than an issue because because it's less of a signifier to know about a band. I mean, everything is accessible now if right, you have a connection. Right, to the and internet. plus the whole model of major labels and independent labels doesn't really exist like it used to. It's not the same, and it's certainly not the same as far as like you're either this or you're that. You know, it's like, right. You know, it d doesn't really matter. You know, I mean, most of the kids, a lot of kids today not even kids, people find out about music on YouTube. It's not a, about like, what label are they on? And, and then I'll go see if they're cool or not, or, or if I might like it or not, you know? Was it fun to be on Capitol? Did you feel like, hey, we're on the same label as the Beatles? I never felt like we were on Capitol okay. or off Capitol. It was kind of like, you know, we went there one time to the building that... And signed we, something and that was it. Well, it was, yeah, it was just kind of like... I, I, Did you I go to I, the top of the tower? I think we smoked a joint on the top of yeah. the tower, yeah. And that's like all I really remember of Capitol. With the devil? Uh, no, he jumped off, but he, <laughs> he spread his wings and flew away okay. and laughing. He looked behind and he winked and uh -huh. he was like, you know, see you guys later. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's like I don't really remember anything about how much it changed except for we got a nice advance. I was able to, you know, uh, put a down payment on a house and, you know, things like that. So – it, you know, it, and then the backlash through the the press and and different people and stuff like that, and we just thought that well maybe the time is right where that stuff's going to be over because we saw Nirvana uh, come through real quick and then you know get picked up and then they just exploded, um, and they exploded so big that it didn't matter who didn't want to come along with them from the old days yeah. or who said ah oh, sellouts whatever you know. <laughs> This episode of The Trap Set is brought to you in part by Colectivo Coffee, handmade coffee since 1993. Check them out online at colectivo.com. Well, what is going on in your life right now? Um, well, in my life right now, um, well, I'm married and I've got three great kids uh, um, who are getting close to grown. Um, how, how long have you been married? I've been married since about 90 Okay. Um, uh, to my wife, Jenny. And uh, 
Then I've got three kids that uh, my daughter is 23. My oldest boy is almost, he's not a boy anymore, he's a man. He's uh, <laughs> almost 22. And then my youngest son. Did you ever catch him blowing shit up? I uh, didn't never catch him. So Suspected I can't say him? he had, well, you know, it's like uh, everybody's got their secrets. And, uh, uh-huh. you know, you're not supposed to know everything your kids are doing. No. That would be wrong. Yeah. You know, for both of us. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, you know. And then your youngest is how old? Uh, he's uh, 15, almost 16, the end of this month. <clears throat> so. What factored into your decision to leave the band? Uh, exactly that, family. Um, it got to be too hard, I think, for me to um, reconcile having what felt like two different lives. Like, you know, here's here I'm a father, and at the time, two uh, very young kids, uh, and let and having my wife do all the heavy lifting as far as that goes, then like, see, honey, going out on tour, you know, I'm going to be drinking my head off, you know, and enjoying myself and playing, you know, rock and roll music. It's fun. And sorry, you can't have any fun, but like you can take care of the kids and stuff. And I wasn't really thinking that way, but that's what it was like, you know. Um, and then just uh, the band became more in demand. And I felt my relationship with my wife and my family was becoming more strained. And that caused me, well, it didn't cause me. I I ended up drinking a lot because I felt the pressure of that. And I didn't know how to combine the two and integrate. So um, I tried to please this side and then please that side. And uh, it wasn't working. It was a bad, uh, bad outcome. Did it get really out of hand? Yes, it did. It got so out of hand where um, at the worst point of it, before I left the band, I was drinking an incredible amount, um, not before we played, um, but because I, I took that part really seriously and I had a great time when we were playing on stage. But the rest of the time towards the end there where we were touring and everything, I, I – felt like I couldn't really have a good time. I was just trying to drink to push away the fact that nothing was really working well. And I was really just uh, pushing away things about myself that I didn't hadn't dealt with or didn't know how to deal with. Or um, And so right then it was all externalizing. It was like, well, if it wasn't for this situation, then I'd be okay. Or, you know, if this wasn't going on in my life, then it, everything would be easy. And it wasn't until later that I, you know, after quitting the band um, and, you know, basically making that choice, well, family, I need to choose this, that I was able to start the process of looking inside and going, well, maybe what is it that you're doing to get in your own way, you know? And like, Did uh, you have help doing that? Did you go to therapy or anything? um, Not at first. Um, I I just... uh, I no, I I did the uh, I did the thing where I had to. Uh, I ended up stopping drinking because I wasn't I couldn't get happy drinking no matter how much I would drink and it was just like this. I didn't want to be that person either and it was just like and at the time I didn't want to manage my drinking I didn't want it to you know so I I just didn't want it to be like a thing right. so I'd gotten so sick of it that <clears throat> I quit I just stopped and. Uh, That was difficult for a while, too, because when I quit the band, I felt like my whole identity was gone. Yes. Because I was – that's who – that's how I thought of myself as, well, I'm the drummer and the Jesus lizard. This is what I do. This is what I know how to do. Um, I have fun at it, enjoy it. And, you know, then that was all, like, gone. And I I did not know how to be me. I, I didn't know how to find me right then. So it was like um, I, w- I went through some pretty serious depression about it, um, although nothing like, you know, thinking about ending my life or anything crazy like that. I'm, I'm too much of a of a optimist for that. But, uh, you know, I just uh, – dark times for a bit. And I have to say that, you know, I have to really honestly credit my wife for sticking with me uh, because that could have ended up in disaster too. But she was uh, – great and that she knew that there was something in there that the reason we got married, the reason we were, you know, fell for each other in the first place, 
that she was able to like stick with me. And then eventually I think I kind of came through it to where our relationship began to deepen and other things started to mean more to me. And like I said, uh, I started to look inside and go, what can I take responsibility for, uh, for the th- way things were going? Yeah. And you know? what did you figure out? Well, I just, uh, I don't know that it's so easy to put into words. Um, I'm not trying to dodge right. the question. I just think that that's, uh, phew, boy, that's, that would take another interview at least <laughs> or two. Uh, but well, there were certain things that Still you recognized about yourself. Like, okay, here's a, an example of how I'm getting in my own way. Like, how do I navigate out of this? Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, part of that was... Give re- me the answers, man. I need to y- stop fucking know, up myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, w- when I arrive, I will let you know. Okay. And then uh, I'll write a book and give it out for free to everyone. Uh you got to charge so, money for that. You know, but it's so funny because that, that is what, what we do as humans. We get in our own way all the time. And sometimes we see it and sometimes we don't. I think sometimes we do it as a challenge. Like, okay, I'm going to do this despite myself. Yeah, we do. We, you're right. I'd agree with that. I think sometimes we uh, make things difficult. But sometimes we make things difficult to say things to ourselves like, see, I couldn't do it. Or right. see, it was too hard. Right. Or see, you know, I knew that would happen. You know, it's like, you know, but I think we we tend to invite a lot of what we put out, which I'm not trying to sound new age or this or that, but I believe it. I, I, I believe it to the core of my being in that what you put out and what you generate and what your intention is towards other people and how you look at the world is very, very much uh, has a true bearing on what comes right back to you. And I'm not even talking about karma or this or that. I'm just talking about the real uh, day-to-day machinations or however you want to say it, um, uh, of living. Um, It's, you know, it's an example would be like if you think people are out to fuck you up. Right. And you really believe that. Well, then you're going to have some people cross your path that will fuck you up or, you know, you're going to encounter that because in some way you're inviting that. And it doesn't have to be something that you consciously say, I'm inviting this, but it's like you you have to – I think you you got to get straight with yourself as much as you can first and strip away as much bullshit as you can and – which is an ongoing process, like we were saying. You don't arrive. You don't ever get at the end of that journey. Uh, there is no maybe not you, but I will. Well, when you do, <laughs> when you do, reach down and lift me up, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start a, a religion when I when well, I arrive. Well, man. you won't even have to start a religion if you arrive. I mean, yeah. you're going to you're going to be everything, yeah. and everything will be you, and then and, and you will know everything, and everything will know you. So, but I, I'm serious about that, you know. Earlier you said that you experienced depression because this central part of your identity was stripped away. You were the drummer of the Jesus Lizard, and then you gave that up. But And that was part of the problem was that, like, I did not know how to define myself as a father, a husband, a man. Right. You know, I, I was just uh, – uh, I was basically still a kid you know, inside that loved to do what he loved to do and didn't want to take responsibility for the things that sucked or were hard to do. So um, that part I needed to look at, you know, I need to do a lot of growing up, you know, and uh, when you're in a band and especially you're having some success and, you know, that's that's not a real... uh, Unless you've already done some work on yourself, that's not a really good context to do a lot of growth, personal growth, unless you're just one of those kind of people, I think. Mm -hmm. In other words, it can – It insulates you you from reality. Yeah, and you have a lot of people over-encouraging you to keep doing whatever you're doing. It doesn't matter what the other things you're doing like partying or drinking or um, 
having fucked up relationships or whatever that is, um, as long as you're doing your thing, you know, and slapping you on the back and stuff like that. And we all want to feel like we're appreciated, you know, and that we're good at something and that people like us, you know, and especially if you're a performer, no matter how much you say, you know, oh, yeah, I just do it for the music. It's like, no, you want to be acknowledged. You know, we all do. That's a human thing. You want to be acknowledged for something that you stand out from the crowd a bit, you know, and that's natural. That's okay. That's not a bad thing. But like own that part, you know, like, you know, so like. So how do you satisfy that part of you now? It's just kind of like an <clears throat> ongoing process to be, uh, to really show up, you know, and be yourself, be authentic and like, uh, you know, not, not try to be what you think someone else wants you to be, you know, which is how I used to be for most of my life, you know, and like. When did you have that realization? Oh, I'm trying to please everybody else. Uh, I kind of, I think I knew that for a long time, but I was more comfortable with that because I liked being liked and I didn't yeah. want to, I didn't want to create controversy or conflict is yes. a better way of saying it. So I was a conflict avoider. So instead of saying, you know, you know what, I think that sucks or what you're doing is wrong or I don't believe that or whatever, um, instead of taking a stand so much, I would be more like the amoeba, you know, like, uh, you know, the, the cell that can go inside another cell or something like that. And it's like, because I wanted to be, uh, I wanted things to be easy. And I, I thought for most of my life that conflict is bad yeah. and it's not even a bad thing. It's just it's a necessary. thing. And sometimes it brings you to a much better place and you have to allow for that conflict to happen and not always be pushing away things that are uncomfortable or, quote, negative. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So now that your kids are adults and on the verge of being an adult, right. do you want to go on tour again? I wouldn't mind playing uh, out live uh, some, but on a much more limited um, scale. Um, I you, am. Go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I'm just going to say uh, I'm writing music right now with this friend of mine, and it would be nice if we could get um, a band situation to play that live a few times at least just to see what it'd be like. So. What's the uh, concept behind that? Uh, this stuff is uh, all instrumental, and it's um, stuff that I um, had going on that I was trying to do all myself. Uh, and then I ended up uh, enlisting the help of my friend uh, Bob, who plays guitar, to uh, flesh out some of the stuff. Uh, some of the stuff already had other instruments as well as drums. Some of it was just drums. So we've got about 10 songs that aren't mixed yet, but they're uh, pretty much all recorded. What are you doing when you're not uh, raising your kids? Do you have, do you have a day job? Um, I'm not working right now. Uh, I was working at School of Rock. Um, I was teaching. How did you like doing that? I liked it a lot. Um, do you feel like as someone who taught yourself, you had a special insight as to kind of how to guide kids without being overbearing? Yeah, well, overbearing is not who I am. I'm not. I'm not that guy. Um, I don't think. Uh, well, no, I know I'm not. Um, but I, having kids myself and being a big kid myself, um, it was kind of easy to teach kids. Um, but I wasn't teaching them like be be this version of me. Do it like I do it. It's sort of like it, what it did for me was like open my eyes to the fact that everybody learns differently. And you need to approach every person differently. And I know you can't do that in a big classroom full of three, 30 kids or, or 100 kids or whatever, but this was one-on-one. -on -one. So it was very good opportunity for me to say, what do you like? You know, what, what, what's going on? And there were all levels there. Like there was strict beginners and there were um, pretty advanced players, you know, for being like 15, 16 years old. And um, 
I enjoyed it quite a bit, especially the ones that were like just could not get enough of it, you know, because I knew what they were feeling. I knew what they were feeling like they could, you know, you practically want to sleep on the drums, you know, it's just like this, is, you know, make love to the drums, you know, yeah, eat with the drums, you know, wash the drums hair, you know, like uh, <laughs> massage, give the drums. the drums a facelift, you know, just say whatever, you know, but well, I think that's a great place to end it. Okay. Mac McNeely, thank you so much for doing this. Joe, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. The Trap Set is produced by me, Joe Wong, along with Chris Karwowski, who also edits the program. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at The Trap Set. And visit our website, thetrapset.net, to subscribe to our show for free. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please donate to our show. If you can't afford to donate, please tell a friend and give us a good rating on iTunes. Send your feedback and guest requests to thetrapset at gmail.com. Yeah.